So it is a beautiful day today. I just got back from the Rio with my family. I had a really great time, got to walk around there and eat some delicious buttery pasta at Quarter Bakery. But something that I definitely did that was even more awesome was by myself this. That's right, Dragopedia Legends by William O'Connor. I'm a huge fan of these Dragopedia books. Hey, yeah? Do you, anything, do you need anything other than string cheese? Um. Do you have to make some to uh, potato rolls? Yeah, I think I still have a few. Okay. Yeah. That's it? Yeah, I think that's it. My mom was calling me. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, I am a huge fan of these Dragopedia books. Yeah, they are so much fun to see all of the artwork and the fantasy creatures, whether it be dragons or in the bestiary. But in this book, it's something even more special. See, this book, Dragopedia Legends, it not only has great pictures of dragons, it also has the stories behind them. Yeah, this Dragopedia book talks about legends. Yeah, real legends passed on throughout many folklore around the world. In this video, I will be reading some of my personal favorite stories of the legendary dragons of folklore from all over the world. Yeah, it'll be a whole lot of fun. Possibly have a lot of inspiration for me to create some of my own myths and legends in my own worlds. Yeah, well... I guess I'd better see to it. Let's go. Okay, let's take a look at the stories of this awesome book made by William O'Connor, The Dragopedia Legends, the book that tells tales of folklore throughout the world about dragons. First, let's go to my fave, one of my favorites. Now, where is it? Oh, here we go. Arctic dragon. Fafnir. Gosh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I mean, the one thing is this book is full of pronunciation nightmares. But still such a joy to read. The Legend of Fafnir. The sword Gram was no ordinary weapon. It was forged long ago from the rich mines of the dwarf king Haredmar, whose son Prince Regin was a talented smith able to shape any armor or sword from gold or bronze. His skill made Haredmar's other son, Fafnir, wrathful with jealousy. When the mighty bronze gram was shaped on the dwarven prince's anvil, Regin knew at once that this was a blade of unequaled craftsmanship and unmatched power. The god Odin decreed that only one worthy of the blade should be allowed to wield it, and he bestowed the sword to Sigmund, king of the Volsungs, who brandished Gram for many years, vanquishing his enemies and becoming a mighty lord. You might be wondering how this gets to the point of the dragon. You'll see. Eventually, however, Odin decided that Graham and Sigmund had become too powerful, so during a battle, he caused Graham to shatter. 
And Sigmund fell to his enemies. The kingdom of the Volsungs was lost, and the queen and her son Sigurd fled the countryside. During this time, Fafnir's jealousy toward his father, Hreinmar, and brother Regin had grown, and he conveyed the golden dwarven horde for his own. Okay, here's where it gets interesting. Twisted and tormented by his greed, Fafnir transformed into a powerful dragon that breathed poison and fouled the lands of the dwarves in perpetual winter, driving the dwarves from their ancestral halls. So basically, what they're saying is that dwarven prince turned into a dragon because he was twisted by his negative, evil emotions. How is something like that possible? It really is quite interesting in my opinion. King Mar confronted his son. Fafnir, what have you done? I have taken what is rightfully mine, father. Now I will be the king of the Golden Hea Hall. Yeah, Fafnir then fell upon his father and slew him. Prince Regin and the dwarves of Hraemar fled the Golden Hall and went into hiding, far away from the wrath of Fafnir. But Regin vowed to return one day to avenge the king and take back their homeland. While taking refuge in the wilderness, Regin met the exiled Prince Sigurd, also on the run from his enemies, and together they plotted to kill Fafnir and share the Golden Horde. Sigurd revealed that he had the shards of Graham. which was once wielded by his father. The dwarven prince took the shards and reforged the legendary sword, perhaps the only weapon powerful enough to kill Fafnir. And there it is. Bearing the sword, Graham, Sigurd set off into the frozen mountains to seek out the lair of Fafnir. After many treacherous days of traveling, Sigurd came upon the icy dwarven halls and entered the great chamber filled with the golden treasure that Fafnir had stolen from his father and brother. Coiled atop the piles of gems and coins, the dragon woke from his slumber at the arrival of the warrior. So, my brother has sent a mortal man to try and slay the great Fafnir, the great dragon hissed. My father and my brother conspired against me. They wished to keep the treasure of the dwarves for themselves, but I was too powerful for them. The gold is now mine and no mortal man shall take it from me. The gray monster reared up to his full height, his skin flecked with scales that shimmered gold. Wow, shiny scales. That's something I would normally expect from an aquatic creature like an alligator or something. Sigurd drew Graham from its sheath and brandished it before Fafnir. The dragon seemed to recognize the blade, and he suddenly hunched down, wary of the intruder in his cave. You know this blade, Sigurd shouted. The sword Graham, wielded by my father, reforged by your brother Regin. Fafnir hissed and snapped his jaws at Sigurd, who stepped aside just in time to evade the bite. The warrior and the beast carefully circled one another, each searching for an advantage. The warrior swung the blade, catching Fafnir along the side. 
but so thick and powerful were his scales that even the enchanted plate of Graham glanced off his armor. Over and over, the two combatants struck, and with every powerful swing of the sword, Sigurd failed to scratch the mighty dragon, much less pierce his hide. Vafnir then belched a cloud of smoke over the warrior. Choking and eyes burning, Sigurd stumbled away from Fafnir and ran hastily from the hall back to the icy, wind-stepped mountain cliffs. Fafnir laughed and taunted Sigurd as he fled. You cannot run, Graham Wielder. You cannot escape the mighty king Fafnir. Blinded by Fafnir's poisonous breath and the forceful wind, Sigurd stumbled and fell into an unseen crevice in the ice. He was not injured too severely in the fall, but when Fafnir emerged from the cave searching for him, Sigurd realized that he was concealed within an icy crack. Come out, little man. Hiding will do you no good. Fafnir snarled. Wedged in the open crevice, Sigurd slowly moved into a crouched position and grasped the hilt of Graham in his frozen fingers as, above him, Fafnir prowled in the snow. As the dragon loomed overhead, Sigurd saw from his low vantage a bare spot on the dragon's chest where the scales did not cover a pale patch of flesh. Wow, a soft underbelly, just like a crocodile or an alligator. Fafnir suddenly swung his head around and spied Sigurd in the crevice. There you are, I found you, little man. Fafnir bared his teeth to finish Sigurd. But the warrior thrust the blade upward with all his might. The magic blade of Graham found its spot and sank hilt deep into Fafnir's chest. The mighty dragon let out a terrible scream of anguish and toppled into the snow. Sigurd pulled himself from the crack and stood ready to strike again, but the dragon was in his death throes. What is your name, Graham Wielder? Fafnir choked. I am Sigurd, son of Sigmund, king of the Volsungs, the young man proclaimed. Fafnir laughed, a hideous sound from the beast's throat. Do not think that by killing me you are safe, Prinsang. Do you think my brother will let you live and share his gold? With that, Fafnir let out a last breath and did not move again. Having vanquished the terrible serpent, Sigur returned to his homeland with Graham and golden treasures from the Horde and reclaimed his father's throne to become king of the Volsungs. Wow. What an incredible story. I mean, really. A jealous, greedy prince, dwarf, through his negative emotions alone, turned into a powerful dragon only to be slain by a beautifully magical and powerful sword. It should be noted here that here it's called Glam instead of Graham. I wonder if that's a typo. You know? Um, the biggest mistake that I've ever seen in these books was when in the bestiary on the last dragon wolf creature instead of the dragon wolf the zuberator the in flight view 
It was the Pegasus' view instead. Yeah, but still, these books are incredible. And now on to the next story. Here is the next story on my favorites list. Mabinogion. Story about the fight between two massive dragons. Here we go. The legend of Mabinogion. The people in ancient Wales lived during a time of great prosperity under the wise and noble King Lud. But it came to pass that the lands of Britain and Wales were set upon by a terrible cataclysm. The earth shook with violent tremors, causing rocks and boulders to crash into homes. The air boiled with smoke, and the heat devastated the crops and livestock. Even the king's castle shook so terribly that walls crumbled. The Welsh people begged their king to save them. King Lud listened to their cries and ventured out into the mountains to discover the source of the tremors. In a valley at the foot of Snowdonia, he came upon two titanic dragons battling one another, one white and the other red. The mighty red dragon was the symbol and pride of Wales, but there in the valley, the red dragon was embroiled in a terrible battle with a white dragon of the north, a scourge from the icy lands over the sea. Together, the two titans shrieked and bellowed, spewing gouts of flame all around them in massive swaths and tearing up the land. At night, the two monsters would fall exhausted to sleep in the valley below, only to resume their combat again in the morning. The king was dismayed by the roaring of the great dragons. The fields where the people grew crops were burned by dragon fire and gouged by tearing claws. Black smoke choked the landscape. Children cried in their cribs while their parents starved, and the walls of the villages crumbled from the terrible quaking of the earth. Great King Lud, the people begged, save us from the dragons. Lud was a brave and noble lord. Mounting his horse and bearing his shield and spear, he rode out with his best champions to try and stop the dragons. The land all around the monsters was torn and broken. The fire and smoke from their battle made the earth quake so that no warrior could stand. And the air was so choked with sulfur smoke that they could not breathe. Many warriors were crushed by the beast's flailing claws and strangled by the dragon's fumes. At night, the two beasts fell exhausted into the restless sleep in the valley of the mountains, allowing Lud and his knights to escape. Nothing the knights did could stop the beasts, so King Lud sought out the council of the ancient wizard Merlin. Lud traveled throughout the many kingdoms of Britain trying to find the sorcerer, but wizards who do not wish to be found are rarely discovered. At long last, deep in a cave, Lud came upon the venerable seer. Merlin, I beseech you, Lud said. The lands are beset by a terrible war of dragons, and the people are suffering. Please tell me how to rid the kingdom of this plague. Merlin stroked his long gray beard, and his eyes seemed to glow with mischief from under his dark hood. I shall tell you, great king, Merlin said in a gravely voice. First, you must dig a great pit in the center of the valley, and then you must fill the pit with honey mead. 
When the dragons come next to do battle, they will crawl into the pit, drink the mead, and fall into a stupor, and be unable to rouse themselves. Once the dragons are asleep, you must bury them deep in the earth so that their wrath should not destroy all the land. King Lud thanked the old sage and raced back to his people. He did as the wizard instructed and gathered all the knights and soldiers to dig the pit in the valley. A thousand wagons brought kegs of honey mead from all over the kingdom to fill the hole so that it looked like a lake. Once again, the red and white dragons came to the valley to do battle. Before they could begin the fight, the two terrible lizards spied the pool of honey mead and went to the edge to drink. Lod and his men watched as the dragons drank and then crawled deep into the pit to reach the last of the sweet brew. Before long, the dragons had fallen asleep at the bottom of the pit. Altogether, the king and his men used shovels and spades to bury the great dragons. By morning, the pit had been filled and the dragons' battles no longer plagued the kingdom of Wales. The king decided to commemorate the great battle by emblazoning the red dragon on his coat of arms. Today, the same dragon embellishes every flag of Wales. As the years passed, the people were no longer troubled by dragons. Although smoke can sometimes be seen issuing from the earth where the dragons lie buried. Wow. So they basically filled an entire pit with mountainous amounts of sweet-tasting alcoholic beverages. In order to make the dragons so drunk that they'd fall asleep and be unable to wake up as they buried them within the earth. A very creative idea to deal with them. Look at that. They sure are incredible drawing like this. Hmm. I'll turn this page somehow. And there's the battle. Quite incredible, isn't it? I just love dragon battles. I mean. Check out my shirt. It's got two dragons fighting. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess it's time to move on to the next story. The next story we're going to be looking at is the legend of Python. This is a special story because this story is from Greek mythology. Yeah. Ancient Greece where my ancestors were back then, like Spartans and all that. Okay, here we go. The legend of Python. Hera, the queen of the gods, was terribly jealous. King Zeus was an unfaithful husband, romancing the young and beautiful goddess Leda. Before long, Leda became pregnant with Zeus's child and was ready to give birth. This enraged Hera, who did not want to share a family with another woman. She was afraid of the threat the child might become, so she harassed Leda and brought forth the serpent Python, a monstrous and terrible worm that presided over Mount Parnassus. The home of the temple of the Oracle of Delphi, Typhon, I mean, Python was a creature of destruction and poison that breathed clouds of foul, sulfur smoke that choked all life. Fearing for her child, 
let her travel far from her home to give birth and raise her child. Let her give birth to twins, Artemis and Apollo. The young god Apollo was a handsome boy like his mother and powerful like his father. Growing up in exile, Apollo vowed to return to the world, but the desolation wrought by Python made the land uninhabitable. Apollo decided he would need to slay the dragon and rid the world of its wasteland. Knowing that Python was created by Hera, Apollo understood that only the most powerful weapons could slay him. The young god knew of only one god talented enough to create such a weapon. Apollo traveled deep into the underworld in search of his half-brother Hephaestus, who had been thrown out of the palace of the heavens by his mother Hera because of his birth deformities. Apollo found a face just toiling at his forge and anvil, and Apollo described what he intended to do. Any plan to undo the designs of his mother was to Hephaestus' liking, so the two brothers schemed over their mutual hatred of Queen Hera. Hephaestus agreed to make a powerful silver bow with golden arrows for Apollo. Seek out the oracle who lives in the cave on the slopes of Mount Parnassus Par 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 in the shadow of Python, Hephaestus explained. She will be able to help you in slaying the monster. When it was completed, the beautiful bow and arrows gleamed in the firelight of the forge. Apollo armored himself in a breastplate and shield given to him by his brother and sent out to slay Python. The wasteland of Python was a barren expanse of jagged rocks and stinking smoke where no living thing could thrive. Not a tree or a bird lived in that valley of death. Apollo crept warily to the cave of the slopes of the mountain Parnassus where the oracle made her home careful not to rouse the great serpent. Inside the smoke-filled temple, Apollo found the oracle sitting on her throne. Son of Zeus, the oracle spoke without opening her eyes. You have come to free this land from the curse of Python. I have, said Apollo, but I do not know how to slay the dragon of Hera. Python is a powerful creature given life by Hera, the queen of the gods herself. In order to plague this land so that Leda and her children would not have, would have no place to rest. Gosh. The oracle explained, to fell the beast, you must pierce one of its eyes with your golden arrow. Only this will destroy Python's dominion over the land. Apollo was wary, but steeled himself for the task by thinking of his beloved mother and his contempt for Hera. He crept from the cave of the oracle in search of the dragon. He climbed across the jagged rocks where the serpent dwelled and called the creature out. Great and terrible Python, thrall of Hera, come out and meet your doom with the hands of Apollo, son of Zeus, Apollo shouted. The ground shook with the coming of Python. The giant serpent filled the landscape, and its mighty jaws boiled with fire like the volcanoes of Thera. The glowing embers of its many eyes lit the smoky darkness of the land. The coils of Python racked the ground like an earthquake. Apollo struggled to keep his footing as the very rocks of the earth split open under the terrible serpent's armored scales. Apollo drew forth the bow and arrow of Hephaestus and aimed on and aimed unerringly at the eyes of Python as the oracle had instructed him. Before he could release the arrow, another trevor cracked a fissure open at Apollo's feet. He leapt just as the ground beneath his feet fell away, but he landed hard on the rocky ground, spilling the arrows from his pouch. Python's thundering steps pounded closer, and Apollo looked up at Python's eyes as the beast loomed over him. 
Apollo snatched an arrow from the rocks and deftly notched the shaft. He drew back the powerful string and released. The arrow, the loose arrow, fell true to its mark and pierced the serpent's eye. The mighty serpent thrashed and lifted its powerful body in its death throes, bellowing in screams that rent the sky like crashes of thunder. Before it fell lifeless to the earth at the feet of Apollo with a tremendous crash. With the death of the titanic monster, the smoke blew out of the valley and the sun broke through the clouds. Apollo buried the body of Python at the foot of Mount Parnassus and the site became known as Pythia. Before long, the wasteland of the serpent was transformed into a beautiful valley and the sacred temple was erected on the site. For years to come, the faithful would hold games and feast to celebrate the victory of Apollo over Python. Wow, what a story. And here is Python. Very strong and powerful worm, much larger and more dangerous than average. Serpentine dragons sure are ferocious. Yeah. Okay, on to the next story. In nearly all of the stories of this book, the dragons are portrayed as the villains. But this story does not portray the dragons as villains. That's because they weren't villains to begin with. This is the story of the four dragon kings. And this story is from China. The legend of the four dragon kings. In ancient China, there dwelt four brothers known as the Four Dragon Kings. Quilong the Green, who lived in the castle by the East China Sea, controlled the season of spring. Zulong the Red, who lived in his castle by the South China Sea, was ruler of the summer. Balon the White, who lived in his castle in the west at Quinai Lake, controlled the season of autumn. And Heilong the Black, who lived in the north at Lake Baikal, controlled the season of winter. Together, the four brothers kept peace and prosperity, ruling over the many kingdoms of China bringing rains in the spring, warm summers for the growing season, cool nights for the autumn harvest, and snow in winter. Which basically means that three is three, no, four. These four dragons controlled the seasons of China put them all in perfect balance. So these dragons are heroes. They're good. The people loved the four brothers and made offerings to them at the many temples built in their honor. In one small village lived a young girl named Liwa who adored the four dragon kings. Every sixth moon, Liwa would travel far from home to the temple of the Dragon Kings, where she would burn incense, recite her vows, and march in many processions to show her love for the dragon gods. Why do you travel so far to pray to the dragons? Liwa's friends teased her. You are just one little girl. Do you think that the great and powerful dragon gods notice you and hear your offerings? Liwa took no notice because she knew that it was not important whether the dragon gods noticed her. 
It was only important that she showed them her respect, that even the smallest person could make a difference. Not everyone loved the four brothers. An evil sorcerer named Wu Peng resented the power the brothers held, the power the brothers held, and was jealous of the love the people had for them. Wu Peng dreamed of possessing the powers of the dragon kings and could use and could then rule all of China himself. Uh, let me try that again. Wu Peng dreamed of possessing the powers of the four dragon kings and could then rule all of China himself. The sorcerer learned that there existed a powerful dragon orb that would be able to control the four brothers. So Wu Ping set out on a quest to find it, and, at long last, in an ancient temple on a mountain, he found the orb set in an ornate staff. Wu Peng struck the great dragon orb staff into the rock and called, Great Dragon Brothers, I, Wu Peng, summon you from the four corners of the world to do my bidding. Unable to resist the powerful lure of the orb, the four brothers were torn away from their kingdoms and brought to the mountain top where Wu Peng stood. Though their powers were mighty, the dragon kings were bound by the power of the orb. The dragons thrashed in torment as they struggled, but alas, the terrible wizard wrestled control over the four dragon kings. Anguished inside, but under Wu Peng's spell, the dragons followed his horrific instructions and to devastate the land and bring many kingdoms under Wu Peng's rule. The people abandoned their farms and the cities to seek shelter in the mountains. The rain from Kulong washed away the farms. The fires from Zulong burned the trees. The icy sleet from Heilong froze the birds in the sky and Beilong breathed choking smoke that blotted out the sun. Together, the four brothers terrorized the land they loved and were powerless to stop the evil sorcerer. The young girl, Liwa, wished to help the four brothers and stayed behind when her parents fled the village. What can you do? her parents asked. You are just one little girl. You cannot make a difference. Undeterred, Liwa ran through the dark landscape to find the castle of Wu Peng, where the four dragon brothers rested on the mountain top. I am here to help you, Liwa said to the brothers. The dragon kings looked tired and defeated. You cannot help us, little girl. Be gone before the wizard awakes and finds you, Quillon said to her. But there must be something I can do, Liwa said. The great dragon orb must be destroyed, Heilong whispered. Only that will set us free. Great dragon orb. Wielded by Wu Peng. In the night while Wu Peng slept, Liwa scrambled up the mountain to the castle. The castle was guarded by terrible demons. But Liwa was small and able to sneak past them. She wandered through the halls of the castle until she came to the Hall of Wu Peng. A powerful warrior would not have been able to break through the iron doors, but Liwa was little and slipped unnoticed through a crack in the wall. Inside, Wu Peng slept on his golden throne with the great dragon orb staff resting beside him. Silently, she crept up to the throne, took hold of the staff, and slipped it away from Wu Peng's grasp. The wizard suddenly awoke and was startled to find Li Wa holding the great dragon orb in her little hands. What are you doing, little girl? he sneered. Give that to me. Li Wa lifted the orb over her head and with all of her might smashed it at her feet. A blinding flash and crack of Thunder accompanied Wu Peng's shriek of horror. No! 
Outside the castle, a great roar bellowed through the air, a cry of rage from the furious dragon kings. At once, the roof of the castle was torn off, and the dragon kings released from the power of the orb turned their fury on Wu Peng. He screamed as they snatched him up and swallowed him. The four brothers were eternally grateful to Liwa for saving them from their enslavement to Wu Peng. Zhu Long let Liwa climb on his back and the Dragon Kings flew the one who made a difference back to her home village where her parents embraced her. The four Dragon Kings returned to their own castles where they live to this day, ruling over the four corners of China and bringing prosperity and good fortune to all. Yeah, I really like this story because this portrays the dragons not as villains. And they, they were actually good. They're forced to work for evil. Usually they're separated. Usually they're four separate dragons. But Wu Peng's magic turned them into a four-headed dragon. It really is incredible. I just love multi-headed dragons. This picture of the four dragon kings under Wu Peng's control is quite extraordinary. You could see the glowing eyes they have. They're like that because they're under Wu Peng's control. And there's Wu Peng with the dragon orb controlling the brothers. Okay, next story. And here we have our last story. Zeme Gorinich. No, Zeme Gorinich. Zeme Gorinich. Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce that. The Legend of Zmeg Goinich. This is a Russian story. Once upon a time, in the windswept steppe of Russia, there lived a shepherd boy named Dobrynya, uh, Dobrynya Nikitich. Dobrynya Nikitich. Dobrynya was like most boys in that he loved to run and play in the field and the mountains around his home. Be careful, Do Be careful, Dobrynya, his mother told him. There are many dangerous animals living in the wild, wolves that bite and dragons that breathe fire. I'll be careful, mother, he said, but he paid no heed to her warnings. One day, Dobrynya was exploring the mountains far from his home and came upon a cave near a waterfall. It was a sunny day and Dobrynya was hot from his trekking, so he decided to take a swim. Stripping off his clothes, he plunged into the pool and splashed joyfully under the waterfall. The boy's laughter echoed in the mountains and attracted the attention of the three-headed dragon, Smeg Gorinich, that lived in the cave where she had laid a clutch of eggs. To hide from the six eyes of the ferocious dragon, the terrified boy dove deep to the bottom of the pool. Holding his breath among the reeds, Dobrunaya caught sight of something shining among the grass and mud. He reached out his hand and discovered a gleaming golden helmet decorated with shining carvings. Without thinking, Dovernaya placed the helmet on his head, but realized that he was quickly running out of air on the bottom of the pool, and so he had to surface. Once above the water, he could see the dragons and Meg Gornich prowling along the edge of the water. Dobrynya held very still, and although it seemed that the dragon was looking right at him, he was not seen. Eventually, the dragon went back into his cave. They should be saying her cave, because they refer to her as a she over here. 
Yeah. Eventually, the dragon went back into her cave, and Dobra and I jumped from the water and raced home with the helmet. Mother, mother, Dobrina called as he burst through the door. The boy's mother leapt in fright and looked around for her son, but he was nowhere to be seen. Dobrinaya, is that you? she said. Dobrinaya remembered that the helmet he was, Dobrinaya remembered the helmet was still on his head, and when he took it off, he reappeared before his startled mother. The boy retold the entire story to his mother and showed her the magic helmet from the bottom of the pool. Dobrinaya's mother was very afraid of the dragon and made him promise that he would not go up to the cave ever again and that magic helmets were not toys to be played with. I promise, he I promise, mother, he said, but the promises of young boys are not often remembered. Years passed and Dobrinaya grew up. After his mother passed away, he left the small cottage of his boyhood and went to the capital city of Kiev. Dobrinaya joined the army and through his bravery and wit grew into a knight in the court of Prince Vladimir. One day the court was in an uproar as it was learned that Princess Zabava had gone missing. The servants and the guards searched far and wide, and it was finally discovered that the princess had been taken by the dragon's mate Gorinich while she was out on, on a ride. Prince Vladimir called all of his knights, knights together and asked for volunteers to rescue his niece. Dobrinaya raised his hand. I will go, my lord, he said. I know this dragon named Zemeg Gornich and where she keeps her cave. I will rescue the princess. Dobrinaya was given the finest armor and war horse to do battle with the dragon, and he rode out to the mountains. Dobrinaya returned to the cave of the dragon where he had encountered her before and called out, Zemeg Gornich, it is I, Dobrinaya. Come out and face me. Dobrinaya waited, hoping to lure the dragon out, then sneak into the un cave unseen while wearing his helmet to rescue Princess Abafa unharmed. Dobrinaya waited, but the dragon did not come at his bidding. At last, Dobrinaya could not wait. Placing the helmet on his head, he skulked toward the entrance of the cave. Inside, there was the dragon, as big and fire-breathing as ever. Its three heads casting about in every direction. After many years of waiting, her brood had hatched into little dragonlings. From beyond the dragons, deep in the cave, the knight could hear the princess call. Is someone there? Please help me. Dobrinaya was at once attacked and was swarmed by the small dragonlings who nipped and scratched at the night. Swinging his sword, Dobrinaya slew the small hatchlings. When Zmei Gornich saw her brood had been killed, she flew into a furious rage and attacked the unseen intruder. She unleashed her fire breath and slashed her deadly tail. But every attack was in vain since Dobrinaya was invisible wearing his magic helmet. Swinging his powerful sword, the brave knight severed a head from the dragon's neck, and screaming in anguish, Zmei Gorinich coiled away, only to grow a new head back in its place. The two warriors battled each other for three days, and every slashing blow of Dobrinaya's sword removed one of the dragon's heads, only for a new one to grow in its place. At long last, the dragon was skewered through the harp by the knight's lance, and Dobrinaya burned the dragon's body and buried the ash so it would never bring harm to anyone again. Deep inside the cave, the knight found Princess Zababa and returned with her to Kiev to be reunited with her uncle. The whole city rejoiced, and Dobrinaya and Zababa were married. Wow, what a story. A three-headed wyvern. Three-headed wyvern.
Wyverns are one of my favorite type of dragons. But one thing that I find that's different about this particular wyvern is not only that it has three heads, but also its tail doesn't seem to have any significant spines for poison. All it seems to be is just random spines. Well, anyway, this was definitely an awesome story with an awesome dragon. Just take a look. I mean, here we've got Fafnir, we have the Ice Dragon, we have the Icelandic White Dragon, and the Great Red Welsh Dragon from Mamagodian. We have Snegarnich, we have Python, and of course the four Dragon Kings. Yeah, those are all my favorites of these stories. Quite the incredible dragons from Legends. And that's the end of my favorite things in this book. Wow. It's incredible. Great stories, great drawing, it's fantastic. Well, that's the end of this reading. See ya. Bye.